I am excited to be joined by Brett Copeland today. Brett, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Brett Copeland. I am the Assistant Director of Strategic Communications uh, in the Academic Strategic Communications Office at UTSA. How do you rally leadership support? How do you get people who do not believe in public relations on team public relations and convince them that it is one of the most important C-suite activities? It's, it's about knowing your audience, right? Everybody has a different angle and different lens at, of which they view the world and their role in the world. And as a public relations practitioner, it is your job to figure out what that angle and lens is uh, and design communications that will move them towards action. So it's, it's just knowing who you're communicating with and finding the media uh, and message that moves them. And, you know, in, a, in addition to finding what moves them with, you know, the, the style of communication or what they are viewing the world, the lens they're viewing the world through, you need to have a trusting relationship built with them where they look to you as an expert. That takes time. It takes time and really understanding what their own objectives are and how those objectives intersect with the larger mission and goals of whatever you're trying to accomplish. So it, it takes a lot of time uh, and meeting people where they are before that trust can be established. Yeah. Do you have any way to accelerate that kind of trust? You, you, you need to make sure that someone understands the value and the importance and it takes time to build a relationship, but there's something happening that you see a train wreck coming in the public relations sphere of the company. How do you help them to see the truth? You know, a lot of times it, people can only handle so much in a day, right? If you throw a big mission at them or a big problem that's coming down the road, a lot of times people will shut down because it's hard for them to even conceptualize. So how can you break down the timeline between that event and where you are now into smaller steps and show and deliver, um, you know, really immediate results on some of the smaller items? I think that begins to, sh you know, show your value and your, and builds that trust uh, in the immediate as you do move towards that bigger event. What's a common myth or misunderstanding that people come with to the conversation about public relations? I think that there's still a perception. And although it has evolved since I graduated college, you know, I think there is still a perception that this is an easy thing to do and can be and, and is a shallow kind of career path. Public relations is really difficult. You know, understanding the audiences that you are trying to move takes time. It takes expertise and knowing what questions will get you the information that you need. And it takes a lot of creativity in packaging the right tools and tactics and strategies together uh, to achieve goals. So I think that there is still, a, still a, a perception, especially among kind of executive boards, that you could just fart out a tweet and call it a day, you know, in the same way that you used to just throw out a press release and go have a martini afterwards. Um, it's, it takes a lot of work. And like I was saying before, you know, time has, has shrunk, uh, in news cycles. Um, media is all over the place. We have so many outlets that people are getting information from now. It is a complex web and world out there. Uh, so it, it takes a lot of special specialization, uh, and understanding of, group dynamics of individual people uh, and the way that they view the world in order to craft successful communications. I, I love that you said questions because I'm so interested in the kinds of questions that would move this kind of conversation forward, that would reveal the value, that would make the case to those C-suite people who may not be able to wrap their head around why this is so important. Can you speak a little bit about the kinds of questions that people need to have in their head as they navigate the treacherous waters of public relations? I think that a good starting point is always why. Like we, we are put uh, in front of facts and figures uh, and are told things are moving in certain directions because of X, Y, or Z. Uh, but that's where a lot of folks, I think, stop their analysis. And to really understand how things are moving, you have to just keep asking why. I think there's some, it's some famous thing where you're like, you have to ask why five or six times in order to get to the true meaning of something. You know, why is, is always a good starting point. I know why can sometimes be 
uh, off-putting to people. Sometimes they don't want you asking why. And sometimes when you ask how <laughs> to get to why, <laughs> it doesn't give the results you want. So how do you navigate the difficulty of the why question in an environment that might be not nice or might be a, in an environment that might be hostile to the question why? Well, and that's, you got to know your audience because why can be one word or it could take paragraphs to ask why. You know, you really need to know your audience and approach them uh, in a way where they will help you get to that ultimate answer that you're looking for. It's it's about being genuine, on authentic, and authentically uh, approaching someone from a level playing field. You know, I feel like a, my worst experiences with other PR practitioners has always been uh, when they view themselves as above or outside of the groups that they are trying to uh, work with. You know, that is not, you, you don't build trust in that kind of dynamic. You don't build real relationships or effective communications if you view yourself as apart from the people uh, that you are trying to help communicate with. Do you have any other questions that come to mind? Well, I'm a terrible uh, interview planner because I have, I usually go into interviews with an idea of kind of the story that I want to tell, of course, uh, after working with the different folks that you have to work with, uh, when creating a piece of media, but I just rely on where the conversation goes, you know, having that big objective kind of hanging over me and finding my way through a conversation, uh, that feels natural, you know, going in with scripted questions usually uh, leads nowhere or comes to a very inauthentic kind of end piece. So my interviews, you know, they might take a, a little longer, uh, you know, judging on the how much time I've got and kind of where I'm at relationship wise with the person, if it's the first time meeting them, I'll probably take some time to warm up and just get to know them. So it's, it's less of a, a PR pitch or press up and more of a conversation. Um, so I, I'll, I'll identify that big objective, uh, do my research, of course, as to who they are and what, you know, what they really care about. But the questions should not feel forced. Uh, they shouldn't feel like they're testifying before Congress or before a panel of their peers. Uh, they should feel like they're able to express themselves in a way that is genuine to them. Uh, and then it is the duty of the, the PR practitioner to take the info that they get and either ask for clarification or turn it into a communication that resonates with an audience that, you know, doesn't speak the way that this, these, these folks speak. I've worked with doctors and faculty uh, and policy wonks, and almost no one in their world talks like any of those folks. It takes a long time to kind of work with those experts, those subject matter experts, and get to the real meaning of what they're trying to say in ways that external audiences wonder, with, would understand. Uh, so just time, preparation, and genuine conversations I, is helped me be successful. How do you navigate? How do you hold our hands and help us to communicate in a way that can be more influential and and palatable for our audience so that our that our audience and we connect in a way that is more meaningful? Well, I think it's always helpful to show evidence, right? You 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 can hear a lot of uh anecdotes about what kind of media people ingest these days. Uh, but unless you see the data, you know, it's hard to, to really conceptualize uh, when it, it comes to producing work. So providing examples to subject matter experts of kind of what works with the audience that you're trying to move so that they have uh, a fore, uh, foreknowledge of what you're looking for is helpful. Uh, but again, I think it is just the job of a public relations expert to come in and help mold those communications and work with that subject matter expert to get it to a place it needs to be. I love editing. I love editing so much, uh, but I hate that first draft. Uh, so I always like going through um, and helping uncover the story in that second draft. Uh, 
And often, you know, we'll find that the person I'm working with, the subject matter expert will go, that's exactly what I was trying to say and be amazed that uh, it was there the whole time. Uh, and often give me undue credit for helping uncover it when these were just their words. Uh, we just had to kind of get rid of some of the dust and clutter uh, to really make them shine. Public relations professionals need to know so many different things, but one of the core things they need to know is what kind of skills they need to work on in order to get that first job in public relations and hone their craft. What kind of skills do you recommend people really focus on to prepare for this kind of career? You know, I think that first job is, you know, almost different than any, every other job that you're going to have after that. Um, a solid portfolio, you know, one of the, the things that we were chatting with uh, one of our students who uses Adobe, uh, UTSA's Adobe products, is they were able to turn their InDesign resume and portfolio into a digital link uh, after printing out dozens of copies uh, to go to a physical event. The physical event was canceled uh, and all those other folks, you know, essentially had to hold on all this printed material, uh, but she just changed it into a PDF, put it on a QR code and sent it out to all the recruiters that she would have met in person there. So that first you know, that first portfolio, that first resume, it, it is helpful to be a showstopper and be able to communicate in a lot of different ways to a lot of different people. As you move, and as I have moved in my career, I, I still think the most critical skill for a public relations practitioner is solid writing. Um, writing continues to be, you know, a challenge for me. I am still learning how to refine and uh, get better at my writing, but it is really at the core of all that we do. Although we may produce videos and, uh, you know, create visual collateral and approach people on social media, which requires very few words, good writing, uh, there's no substitute for it. Uh, because behind those videos, behind the, the graphics and behind the tweets and social posts, you know, there is a strategy that has been clearly developed, sold to executives, um, and has a real justification behind why it's worth putting energy into that video or visual or tweet that will result in a tangible outcome for whatever, whatever organization that you're working for. Uh, that all begins with the written word. So clear writing, uh, creative writing that is you know, creative, clear, uh, and these days probably brief uh, is really important. Uh, so being able to identify narratives and stories and using words that connect with the audiences that you are, you're trying to target, it all begins with solid writing. Being someone who reads about writing, you might have some tips or some ideas to help students write from a frame that is more productive as a public relations professional. So do you have any advice about writing specifically so that anyone listening or watching this can take it and just run with it and say, okay, I'm gonna work on that specific part of my writing. You need to ingest the kind of media that you're writing for and really take a hard look at how people in whatever audience sphere you're targeting communicate and practice writing that way. Uh, in arguments and structuring your narratives uh, that appeal to them and be a ruthless editor, you know, get rid of the junk. Don't try and say too much at one time uh, and really make sure that people understand what you're trying to communicate, you know, up, up at the top very quickly. Do you have some books or resources that you recommend for public relations professionals? I very rarely reread books. I kind of take what I need and ditch them, but there are a couple that I, uh, keep going back to year after year, the first being Elements of Style by Strunk and White. Uh, and this is always just a quick review. It is not very long, but it's a nice, it's a nice foundation of what good writing is. Uh, and Writing Tools, I think is the next one that I'll probably leaf through every couple months, just as, as little reminders of what, what makes effective communications in an interesting way. And then I'll always, you know, I'm always on the lookout for new books or publications that um, help transform and maybe keep 
keep me current in, in the current media atmosphere that we're living in. And the latest for me is uh, Smart Brevity. I had the fortune of meeting Mike Allen uh, back when Politico was was in its infancy, and it has been really neat to see how that organization, that publication, uh, has transformed just DC media and the way that we talk about politics in this country. And I think that they're doing again with Axios and this smart brevity. Awesome. Thank you for sharing those. Do you have any advice for someone who's just starting out in public relations? What, what would you say is the number one thing they need to know or do? So when I, when I first got to DC for an internship, um, I was a, a fellow at a now defunct PR firm that got bought out by a bigger PR firm. But I, I just went out and met people and attended events uh, that had people there that I wanted to hang around. And at one of these things, I had the good fortune to talk with uh, Frank Mankiewicz, who was Bobby Kennedy's press secretary. And um, he was a gentleman uh, farther up in his years at that point, of course, uh, but it was really remarkable talking with him. And I asked him, you know, if I want to live an, a neat life and experience kind of a lot of the things that you have been able to in your career, do you have any advice for me? And he said, just volunteer, just volunteer. It's the same thing I told you two weeks ago when we met. And I had met him before and I had asked him the same question. So Frank taught me two lessons that day, just volunteer. And that when you approach someone, never underestimate the, the audience that you are talking to, because there is a good chance that they will remember you and will, uh, remember what you said before. Uh, I was running interference in that instance for Tammy Haddad, who was the, uh, a DC socialite who was best known uh, in the book, This Town. But I thought I could get away with asking this older gentleman uh, the same question because I wasn't that creatively interested. I was just doing a job for somebody else and it, and it bit me, but it taught me two very important lessons. Uh, just volunteer and never underestimate your audiences and always come at them uh, from a genuine point of view. Do you have any other mistakes that have taught you lessons? Because I think mistakes are the most powerful tools and teachers in our arsenal of things that make us better. Having a good personal group of advisors, whether you want to think of them professionally or as peers um, or friends or mentors, you need to have a good mix of folks around you if you're going to stay relevant and um, understand kind of where things are moving, whether it's in PR as an industry or the media world. Um, you need to have a good diverse group of folks around you uh, to really get to the heart of what uh, makes a good communication. We spoke of the importance of writing. Is there another thing that people can do today? Is there an action that they can take, something concrete that will help them in their career? I would say, you know, and coming from a point of privilege, acknowledging that, uh, but do things that are terrifying to you. I am not a natural networker or a person who likes to be on camera or be the subject of a story. Um, so there's been a lot of times that it's, it, it has felt like uh, I'm standing on the edge of the cliff and the networking event is in front of me and I have to throw myself off the cliff to go get it done. Um, but do scary things to you because that's how you grow. Uh, that's how you learn and uh, meet some really incredible people that you wouldn't otherwise have uh, if you had just stayed comfortable. So do scary things and whatever that means to you, uh, do scary things because it will result in a career that you probably haven't even thought of yet. I'm curious, how, where do we draw the line between terrifying shouldn't do it and terrifying should do it? Because I know there, there are times in my career when I absolutely didn't want to do something and I was just had too much anxiety about it, but I did it anyway and it paid off. So how do we, how can we t have the wisdom to know the difference? Obviously, if bodily harm is at the end of one of those decisions, don't do that. But um, I think we, we construct a lot of narratives for ourselves as people about what could happen when we really just don't know. Um, whether it is going and seeking a new mentor uh, for from an organization that maybe you 
have never been a part of, but that you really value their work and value the leadership of whoever you're looking uh, for that mentor relationship with, don't be afraid to just send them a note, come at them authentically and really provide and show your own value of what you can do for them uh, so that it's not just a one-sided relationship, but don't be afraid to initiate or kick that off. Um, don't be afraid to go out and do something new. You know, again, going back, public relations is a very versatile field. Uh, if there is an area of business that you think would be successful, investigate it. Uh, don't think that you are pigeonholed to just one, um, one career path. You have a lot of potential out there in, a, in the way that the world is changing and has changed. Um, who knows what happens next? So if you are passionate about something, if you're coming at it authentically uh, and you are actually delivering value for the folks that you're serving, go do it. Have you found any tensions in the public relations discipline that might help inform our audience? You know, I think that there is a lot of, with the contraction of um, newspaper staff and media teams, there is a real loss of nuance in reporting. And the market has really rewarded folks uh, who make big pronouncements or outrageous statements. And that might work on social and getting folks' eyes certain places, but it certainly doesn't make as big an impact in people's day-to-day -day lives. So I think that kind of holding that in balance, because execs are going to want to see the KPIs, the, the key performance indicators and results and analytics uh, that shows you're making a big, big splash on social and uh, web views and all of that. But we cannot take for granted the relationships uh, that are built person to person um, and that require often uh, a lot of nuance and coming at folks from where they are rather than kind of hitting them over the head with what your main message is and hoping that they identify with it. So I think that across the industry, you know, although the rewards may seem like they lay in saying the most outrageous thing. Uh, the thing that still moves markets and elections and uh, different groups of people are still those smaller communications, smaller maybe, but consistent communications uh, that reach people in a way that they're ready to receive. This idea of old school versus new school is always fascinating because I'm sure there are threads that connect the two very easily. Do you have some principles or ideas that are just as relevant and just as valuable to someone managing a social media account or, or the next new thing that are just as valuable to that old school press release? Uh, are, there thing, are there connections that you see there that, that join these kinds of things together in the study and practice of public relations? They all live in the same toolbox of the public relations practitioner. There is a right tool for the right job. You just got to shake it out and understand what it, uh, what it is supposed to do. So whether it's social or a public relations press release, old school style, how do you know when you've been successful? How do you measure and evaluate your success? Too often in my career, I feel like I haven't known when I'm successful or something has been a dud because that that very critical part uh, at the beginning, planning, strategic planning, uh, that defines clear objectives and goals has not taken place. So really, I know that I've been successful if we've had those kind of conversations with our stakeholders um, and clearly outlined and that they understand uh, what the goals are and are ready to support the communications uh, and the strategic plan. Um, because Unless that conversation happens and those uh, folks are bought into what is coming afterwards, there's no way that you're going to be successful. So strategic planning, uh, identifying key results, um, identifying objectives, understanding um, what audiences that you're targeting, all of that has to be solid. Uh, so if you have a solid strategic plan that allows for flexibility and have you have an understanding that it could change depending on uh, how things move, you know, I think that's the best uh, starting point for success. Have you ever had a time when you thought you did everything right and all of those 
key performance indicators were lined up. You had talked to the stakeholders. You you had your objectives lined up. You had the plan, and it all, and and then something happened, and you were like, "Wait, I didn't expect that to happen because I had all of my ducks in a row. I had everything checked off my list. I had everything that a good public relations practitioner should do done." One of the first. Uh major things that I did as a communications director was handle the response to, uh, at the time, the largest data breach of personal uh, information uh, that had happened across the federal government. This was 2015, 2016, I think. Um, But 80 million Americans PPI was uh, accessed uh, and the union was filing a lawsuit against uh, OPM for failing to upkeep its systems to where and protect against that. And had put together the strategic plan, had worked with our legal departments, had worked with our communications uh, folks across the country, had worked with our president's office. You know, I thought all ducks in a row. We got our press release ready. We've got the social drafted. Um, we've got an ad scheduled to go out in the Washington Post. You know, everything is ready to go. Uh, arranged for an exclusive with a reporter. Uh, While we were on the phone with the reporter, um, it was a Friday afternoon, the lawsuit was being filed, and we were given this exclusive to the reporter. And a news item pops up, a breaking news item saying that we were suing OPM as we're on the phone giving this exclusive to this reporter. The person who delivered the lawsuit did not account for the reporter who was sitting outside the office and like just just hanging out, seeing what was going to come in on a Friday. Didn't account for that reporter just hanging out uh, at the courthouse, watching what was coming in. So had I known that or anticipated that, I would have changed the exclusive date uh, and pushed back against our legal team uh, for waiting until the last minute. Uh, but just something I had not anticipated. And it was super embarrassing, especially being on the phone, giving the exclusive and see it come across the wire. I can imagine. And we, no one has a crystal ball, right? That's, that's a totally understandable mistake to have made. But now that you know that that had, that can happen, it probably changed the way you did business, right? It definitely um, made me more assertive in the role that communications planning plays uh, with other senior executives. You know, the legal team was really adamant that we're going to do this at the last minute on a Friday. There's nothing that you can say to change our minds when we could have probably done it on a Thursday, given the exclusive uh, and followed all the steps as needed uh, with their legal priorities. So really um, made me more assertive and, of, of communications needs and its impact on the success of the organization overall. A, a literal example of someone beating us and telling the truth faster, right? Because we, we say, oh, we got to tell the truth faster and better than, you know, someone else who might hear their version of the truth. Can you speak a little bit about that tension between speed and accuracy? So speed and accuracy, it's a, it's something that you always try and find a balance on, right? You it, it really just takes a lot of preparation, really knowing the organizations that you're working for and having a, a, a network of relationships in place so that you can um, be speedy. Um, because when the call comes, you have moments to come up with a response. And unless you have, know where everything is and know who the experts are, there's no way that you are going to be able to keep up with that pace. Brett, thank you so much for joining us today. Where can our audience find you online? Well, I just want to thank you first. It's been such a fun conversation, and it's always good to geek out with a fellow comms nerd. Uh, Nobody else talks like this. This is all public relations and communications majors talking like this, so it's it's really nice to connect with somebody on that. But uh, for folks who want to find me online, I am on LinkedIn at Brett W. Copeland. Mm 